Hi everyone, today we have another very special guest, Surya Ramachandran. Surya is an engineer from Chennai who later pursued his passion into the wild. His jungle journey commenced in the forests of Satpura National Park um, at the Fort Sitz Lodge. He started as an intern and then has become a full-time naturalist. The need to guide people encouraged him to write a book um, and he successfully authored uh, the photo field guide to Central India and is now working on a photo guide to South India which covers 1860 species in South India. He's also one of the certified expedition leaders for the WWF International and their donors. His um, passion and dedication have led him to be um, awarded uh, the prestigious Toft Award for the year 2016. Surya believes that the key to sustainable ecotourism is to keeping the locals at the helm. He is currently working on creating wildlife tours in off-beat destinations and setting up wildlife lodges and experiences in the trans Himalayan belt with the snow leopard and other lesser fauna present there. Welcome, Surya. Thank you, Lavia. Great to talk yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, basically, today I thought I should speak about a few things uh, with regards to how the whole idea of finding snow leopards in the mountains of the Trans Himalaya started, who, who are the people behind it, and what shape it has taken over the years to get to where it is now and what has been the journey, the influences, the various ups and downs of it. And of course, finally actually getting into what goes into finding a cat. So that's kind of what I want to put together today. And to start with, of course, this is the quintessential image of the trans Himalayan mountains of Ladakh, which people have, you know, a large monastery on the mountain top, looking down on a small village with broad valleys. And of course, the, the Indus flowing through the the main uh, valley in between the mountains. So that is the picture of Ladakh which most of the world has. And that's what people have been coming to see. The Silk Route, the landscapes, the people, the beautiful culture of the region, the old forgotten monuments. So that is what has been the attraction for Ladakh ever since it is, it's opening to the outside world in 78 or 74, if I'm not sure if I'm getting the date right, it's 74 or 78. So there's a whole lot of secrets that was had, that have been unfolding over time. So it was a, an interesting mix for a whole new uh, variety of people who had various interests like anthropology, there was of course architecture, there was a lot of history, there's a lot of people trying to find the spiritual side to life. So there's a whole lot of different things happening in this newfound landscape which is open to the world. And of course along with all of that came the casual tourist who was just keen to go there and see the mountains, take in the weather, take in the sights, and of course, the whole uh, culture of Ladakh with the cheerful local Buddhist folk with their welcoming julays, all of that put together, I mean, the place had something really going for itself. But amongst all that, there was one final thing that brought in a whole new set of people into the landscape and that is this animal, the snow leopard. So, it took a long time for this process to become one of the mainstream tourist attractions of, for Ladakh or uh, one of the main income generators for the local population, I'll put it that way. But there was a lot of people involved, like I told you, in this process and I want to just talk about that. How we came from actually thinking that it's an animal which is impossible to see to taking pictures like this, you know, in, barely in a span of 15 to 16 years. And that is kind of how the, the understanding of this animal and the way people are working with this animal has transformed over time. So, before we actually jump into the snow leopard, I'd like to tell you where exactly we are in the world and where we are talking about. This is of course a map of northern India and you can see that the arc of the Himalayas goes cutting through the landscape from the right bottom of the frame all the way to the center with all the snow-capped peaks. You can see like it's a curve of white. And the landscape to the south of it is lush green and the landscape to the north of it of course is drab and brown. So that is because the Himalayas have kind of formed uh, a barricade for the monsoon winds, the, the moisture laden winds from the south. So the land to the north of it is called the Trans Himalaya and that is the area we are talking about. 
this landscape wasn't always like this it wasn't always barren uh, there was of course a huge coming together of land masses around 50 million years ago when the southern uh, land mass from gondwana which broke off moved north to hit, hit the eurasian plate and that kind of pushed the himalayas up and that pushing up of the mountains has created this very shriveled uh, almost like a barren cold desert landscape to the north of it and that is what we know as ladakh and the beauty of this whole thing is if you go to the right spots in ladakh like lato valley which i'm showing here you can actually see this happening in front of your eyes and that is why geology in ladakh is another vast topic i know a little bit about it but i don't want to get into it too much today because our topic of discussion is something else of course uh, in this trans himalayan landscape over time the silk route was the main reason for its flourish uh, flourishing over the years and the city of leh benefited the most and because it is right in the base of kardungla which helped people coming from the north uh, gave gave them a sarai or a base in which they can stop and take rest and also refuel resupply and carry on with their journey and that was the city of leh which is the capital of ladakh now but if you leave the city of leh what you are seeing is a lot of mountains a population density of less than 3 people per square kilometer so essentially it's small villages hamlets and maybe largeish villages set amongst the mountains with a looming large grand monastery overlooking them from above a hill top so that is pretty much how the, the ladakhi villages are and most of them are self sustaining villages uh, you can see they do when you even when you visit any of these villages you can see that they uh, rearing sheep and goat and of course yak and zo which are the two different kinds of cattle they have is probably the most important uh, uh, income for them and in the during the short summer months they grow their wheat and barley and some crops because the soil is rich mind you despite the cold conditions it's all alluvial soil so the soil is rich and it supports a lot of uh, farming but the, unfortunately because of the altitude where they are which is at 4000 meters the winters can be quite harsh so the the farming period is only about 4 to 5 months so in in a sense like i told you with the population density of less than 3 people per square kilometer you're looking at a 60000 square kilometer wildlife sanctuary basically the whole of ladakh is wild except for the little crowded spots along the indus the city of leh if you leave all these cities also there is a lot of area to explore and there's a lot of wildlife but when you look at a landscape like this despite the fact that it is people free and uninhabited what is it that you're going to look for i mean how do you look for wildlife this is not this uh, like one of the first things that comes to mind when you think of a place where you go looking for big cats or butterflies or birds or anything of that sort it looks lifeless um so of course there is a lot of life here very beautifully adapted to this rocky landscape where they can hide in plain sight and the key to actually figuring out how to find things here is getting your eyes used to the landscape and of course a whole lot of local knowledge so here this picture right somewhere in the right middle you can see a snow leopard perched beautifully on a rock in front of the in the background of snow and that is how beautifully well camouflaged these animals are and it's not just the snow leopard that's so well adapted uh, you also have uh, other ungulates and mammals over here like this blue sheep uh, or burrel i mean don't ask me why they call blue sheep i think they do have a bluish gray tinge in the winter months but essentially this is how they look and this herd of i think there are five animals here was barely 20 meters away from me just off the road but if they hadn't moved it would have been very very difficult to see them you can see how beautifully blended into the landscape they are and apart from big mammals there is a lot of things there is snakes in this landscape there's butterflies there's dragonflies there's amphibians all of them beautifully adapted to blend in with the surroundings and also adapted very well to the high altitude and the severe cold conditions so keeping all this wildlife in mind in the 1980s uh, hemis national park you can see the red uh, marker at the bottom of your screen that's the location of hemis national park to the south of the indus uh, so hemis national park was set up in the zanskar range of ladakh and this happened to be the largest protected area in the country it's called hemis high altitude national park and from there the protection or the conservation of animals in ladakh the story of it started but like i told you 
Ladakh, the problems are different, the solutions are different, and there needed someone who had to dive deep into these problems to actually figure out a solution for the conservation of animals there and for the benefit of the people. So that person was, of course, the person you see on your screen, Dr. Rinchen Wangshuk from the Snow Leopard Conservancy Trust. And he, along with the forest department, did the initial preliminary work. Of course, Dr. Raghu Shundavath and Joanna and all these people did a lot of studies in the Marka Valley prior to him. But when he came in, there was a lot of uh, conservation work as such, based on the data that was available to him, to him that was started. So let me just give you in brief what his problems were. So Ladakh, like I told you, is a very uh, farming oriented society. It didn't have much wood. So most of the corrals were open. The cattle and goats and sheep were actually open. The corrals were open to the sky on the top. So instances like this was very common where, this, where a snow leopard would enter a village at night jump in, kill or take a lot of sheep and goat and sometimes in the panic empty an entire pen of their sheep and go out with one or two or sometimes get stuck in the till the morning to get killed by the villagers. So there was a lot of negativity despite the fact that the people revered this animal, revered all kinds of life following their Buddhist culture. When your uh, uh, livelihood is being questioned by a wild animal, so there was, there was that negativity and remorse. So there was retaliatory killing to an extent. There was a lot of negativity with regards to the snow leopard. So Rinchen wanted to tackle this situation. But before that, before he actually gets to tackle or find a solution, he needed to understand this big cat, the snow leopard, which people knew so little of. I mean, starting from how to find it. You often see tracks, but how do you actually study an animal that you never see? What is the solution? So he had to figure out his own methods. And one of that which really helped him was camera trapping. That is what they did extensively in Hemis National Park in a small area called Rumbak. That is where they did a lot of camera trapping, identified individuals, identified where they are moving, what they are doing, how they mark their territories, what is the number of cats in the area. Even such basic data took a lot of time to figure out. And that's what Rinchen and his team from the Snow Leopard Conservancy did so beautifully over time. And when they had this data, they felt it was time to start working with the locals because without involving the local community, any kind of conservation work is going to be short term. The locals needed to benefit from the fact that there are big cats in their back backyard. And if they didn't feel that way, Dr. Rinchen felt there is no future for whatever he was trying to do. So a lot of the villagers from that area and the surrounding villages were given training to be trackers and spotters. A lot of them were already involved in his, uh, uh, in his study work and a whole lot more people were, were also trained to find these cats, uh, track them and use the spotting scopes and the binoculars to find these cats in the mountains. And one other thing he did was he wanted the income to go directly to the villages when people come to see snow leopards. And for that, he created this network of homestays throughout Ladakh, wherever he felt there is a viable population of snow leopards. But of course, since there was a national park, a lot of attention went into the national park and the homestays in the national park were given training and they were given a whole lot of uh, assistance to start hosting people, especially foreigners. And the rest is history. The, the sightings were great. The cats were uh, quite habituated thanks to the work done by Rinchen and Dr. Raghu prior to him. So there was a lot of uh, things going for Ladakh at that time. So snow leopard viewing in the winter months became very popular. The homestays suddenly became very full. The spotters were fantastic at what they did. So people from all over the world, despite the harsh conditions, decided to come and spend the harsh winter months in the Hemis National Park in search of the the grey ghost of the mountains as it was popularly known. Um, but as you can imagine, because Rumbak, a single spot became very popular, slowly the homestays became too full. Like I said, Rumbak is a small village. It has only around 12 to 15 houses and my number could be wrong, but it's somewhere around there. So when you have more people coming in, what happens is the, uh, the travel agents from Leh and other places decided to put camps. And suddenly there was a situation where you had 200 odd people on a particular big cat and and of course uh, the other thing was the conditions in these uh, uh, in, in Rumbak uh, was quite basic like the people had to walk almost one and a half hours to even reach their homestay and walking uh, one and a half hours in 4000 meters is not a joke in those cold conditions and of course the staying conditions despite having a cheerful host and a lovely set of spotters 
the homestays were basic and they were just what you needed to survive in that place in fact most of them had to sleep with sleeping bags and it kind of wasn't a bad situation to be honest but it kept a whole lot of other enthusiasts away because they were averse to the cold or averse to the altitude or averse to the basic conditions so there was a large chunk of wildlifers who didn't want to come to ladakh or to or didn't want to go exploring the snow leopard uh, viewing chances in the winter months so that is when dr david sonam from the snow leopard conservancy trust uh, actually told us this is when we need to start moving out of the national park and go out and explore other areas where homestays have been set up in snow leopard habitat and we were looking at a multiple set of uh, areas uh, before we closed in on the sham area which is actually an area where uh, dr latika has also been to and she's had a great time there so we actually found this spot which was already of course discovered by dr rinchen and his team but what we felt was different about this place as compared to the national park was there all, of course they already existed homestays and there existed a whole lot of wildlife these were the bare necessities we needed a place to stay and of course we needed a good number of cats a good number of uh, wolves and ungulates and other wildlife so all those things were in place but two factors contributed heavily to ule and mangyu becoming uh, wildlife viewing hotspots and that is this team of 3 and of course other other guys who later joined in to the right is norbu and then there's morup in the middle and funsok to the left these guys can weave magic and how they find the cats is incredible i mean let me tell you one thing if you go to ladakh without one of these guys you may not even see anything when you travel through the landscape looking for wildlife you might see a few birds but it is very difficult and what they do on a daily basis is pretty much magic so having guys like this one of the best snow leopard trackers and spotters in the world in this landscape which we were trying to move into was a big big added bonus and the biggest advantage was the fact that we suddenly had roads there was an entire network of roads connecting every village every valley and every mountain range in this new sham area which wasn't there in hemis so the roads gave us two advantages we can now get people to the lodge and around to other areas without having the need to walk at 4000 4200 meters and also it kind of uh, made it possible to explore a much wider area in search of cats so suddenly we were looking for 13 to 14 cats whereas in other places because of your restriction to walking you were probably looking only for three or four cats so we had a lot more to area to explore and we could also visit other places like monasteries and things like that so the experience was suddenly multifaceted and that's kind of the advantage that this new landscape with its roads brought about so we set up what we call now snow leopard lodge which is basically an upgraded homestay we loaned uh, money to the villagers who did up their homestay and they were very happy to do it up with us and basically on a low interest basis they were able to create a new property from an existing old basic homestay and uh, what we do is we lease it out from them and run on a year after year basis so though though we call it a snow leopard lodge it is basically just a beautiful homestay with where your comfort levels are little higher you actually have uh, a proper dining you have uh, a toilet and you have things like that which you didn't have on in during your stint in a tent or in a very basic homestay so the ethos was the same the experience was the same it's just that the comfort levels were different and suddenly you had a car to move around but one of the main factors which we kept in mind while setting up these lodges was that we wanted to be in the right place so this is the view from one of our lodges can you imagine that we are sitting in the heart of snow leopard country and this is the uh, one of the things that happens in our parking lot which is one of the best places to see cats because we have three or four different mountain ridges surrounding us and uh, most of the sightings or the viewings of cats are from our lodge ground so this is our parking lot with the uh, norbu's house behind and all the photographers are watching a cat right from there and it's quite amazing that that all these things have come together to create this experience of ours so in a nutshell what happens now is that you fly from delhi to leh there are a lot more flights you stay in a comfortable hotel where you can acclimatize for the altitude for 2 to 3 days and then you do a 2 hour drive to reach the lodge where you have a traditional welcome you settle in and it's a lot more comfortable than before and basically that's how easy it's become as compared to what people would have imagined in the 80s 90s and early 2000s how snow leopard tourism actually would have run in terms of climbing the mountains and reading george shaler's book and things like that 
this is what it has become in the course of just 16 to 17 years this is kind of how the snow leopard tourism scenario has transformed so of course when you say snow leopard lodge it's not just the snow leopards that we are talking about we're looking about ibex we're talking about ungulates like uriel which is a wild sheep there is a blue sheep or burrell which we already spoke about uh, there is pikas uh, there is of course the woolly hair a lot of other small mammals and of course uh, canids like the red fox which is found world over which is now in this uh, concept of Ladakh it's called the Himalayan fox and of course the forgotten carnivore of Ladakh the Tibetan wolf which is unfortunately always lived in the shadow of the snow leopard and a lot of conservation focus needs to shift to this animal if we are actually going to save the population of wolves in Ladakh and probably the entire Tibetan landscape and of course great birds Iconic Himalayan birds like the golden eagle, uh, the bearded vulture, the rose finches, the accenters, the partridges, a whole lot of different things to keep one engaged when a big cat is not showing up. So it is a holistic experience, but of course it is centered on this animal, the snow leopard. Uh, this is actually not a real snow leopard, I, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know how well your screen can be seen. So I want to reiterate that this is not a real snow leopard, this is a doll made by the villagers which we sell at the lodge and that is actually an added income for the houses so they make it out of sheep and yak wool but when you actually talk about finding snow leopards it's kind of understandable when you see them on the ridges when they walk along the ridges of the mountains because their silhouette is quite clear but on most occasions this is how it is I mean here in this photo you have two snow leopards right in the middle but when you're looking at this from like 200 to 300 meters away it's so easy to miss them and just to, I just want to put into perspective how, what is the kind of magic that our boys weave on a daily basis when they find snow leopards. You can actually see that there are two snow leopards right in the middle here. Uh, maybe later we can put circles around them and show you. But uh, that is how difficult it can be to see these cats. I mean, just to give you another example, here is a landscape which we, this is a ridge which we see from the lodge. And if I tell you there are three snow leopards here, including a mating pair, I mean, It'll, it'll take a people who are not used to this landscape a lot of time to figure it out. But just to make it easier right now, I'm going to just put a couple of arrows. You can see the mating pair to the right. And of course, the subadal cub or the female wondering what's happening to the left. And that is the level of magic that is being uh, created on a daily basis by our spotters to make sure we snow, see snow leopards. And this is the habitat. I mean, you're literally f looking for a needle in a haystack or a needle in a needle stack, to be honest. And uh, well, their knowledge of the mountains, their knowledge of the habitat and their knowledge of the cats goes a long way in helping find these cats. So, and when I say finding cats, there is a lot of difference between every viewing, of course. Uh, there are viewings which can go on from 500 meters away, which we watch with telescopes. Uh, so, of course, there are ones where the viewings can be uh, not visible to the naked eye. So, roughly when you have the cat at, at about 150 meters odd is, or 100 meters is when you can actually see the cat with the naked eye. So, you're actually dependent heavily on the quality of the optics for which we've actually got Zeiss and Swarovski uh, with us. Uh, mostly Zeiss uh, who have sponsored us at the lodge. So we have very good optics to make sure you can actually use the optics to capture images by putting a camera on the optics. So most of the sightings are like that. Uh, but there are instances where you have kills that are made and like uh, you have, you must have seen a lot of videos. Snow leopards generally hunt from the higher ridges and chase the prey down. So a lot of the hunts are uh, along the mountain gullies and the prey is usually at the lower slopes or in the valley floor and that's where you can find the kills so when you have kills it's actually a lot more easier to get closer to these cats um, so initially uh, as you can see in this picture there were a lot of uh, uh, livestock kills but uh, the snow leopard conservancy came up with this brilliant plan where they brought in a wire mesh and covered the corals and it took something as simple as that to reduce the conflict by almost 95 percent and that, mind you, it is 95% reduced now simply because someone said, let's put a wire mesh so the snow leopard can't jump into the pen. And that's all it took. And in fact, once we, and along with the snow leopard conservancy and a couple of other funders, uh, 
once we kind of got the lot of the houses in the our landscape covered up mainly by the snow leopard conservancy i have to be honest there the we found that the snow leopards in the landscape were suddenly returning back to taking wild prey like ibex and uriel in fact the whole of last year before the unfortunate early shutdown in march we had snow leopards killing only wild prey and no livestock and that is how a simple change in the thought process can actually make a difference in fact we were talking about conservation oriented tourism a people oriented uh, setup but because of the benefits of tourism people are actually changing their lifestyle they didn't mind their goats and sheep being killed because they were suddenly being compensated for that by the conservancy and by the guests uh, so it was very important to make sure their lives lifestyles weren't changed because of the new form of tourism that's coming in so it is very important to make sure that the livestock and the way of life is also also intact and to also make sure the snow leopards were going after wild prey like they are meant to so keeping both of this in mind it has become a a small change in the thought process just like a belly a year and a half or two years ago and this is the kind of difference it's made it's made the whole process more meaningful so if you come to ladakh if you come to snow leopard lodge or wherever you go you can actually see that the locals are at the helm of conservation and at the helm of your experience like fact, i go there as a expedition leader but most of the time what i do is i make sure the locals are well introduced and the the ice is broken between the locals and the guests and then they just take over they are generally a very open cheerful lot and uh, what they do and how they have actually changed their mindsets to welcome this whole conservation tourism ideology into their lifestyles it it's it actually requires a lot of commendation from the rest of the world this is us this is us after a happy time at snow leopard lodge this is our team that's me grinning in the bottom and of course our bunch of guests who decided to come back as soon as uh, this whole lockdown situation is done so i hope you all of you join us i hope you contribute you, you have to realize when you come to a place like this you contribute a lot of not just to the economy you contribute to the ideologies you contribute to the thought process and you take a lot back it is not just like visiting a national park to see a big cat it is your change going into a conservation process which is very well oiled and constantly evolving so what i'll be saying today could be something totally different from what i'll say in a year or two from now depending on what our learnings are but definitely one of the most amazing big cat experiences on the planet and i'm sure latika can vouch for it also and i hope to see you all soon in the landscape thanks surya that's amazing um great presentation i've been chatting with um other members of your team hashim and um rohit sharma and we've been talking about all of the work that you've done with um animals like brown bear and uh, you know um the wolves and things and uh, will you tell us a little bit very briefly about this as well well i mean uh, like i said uh, uh, i mean like you just told everyone uh, i started my work in satpura which you can imagine is was all bears for me sloth bears and i wasn't mm-hmm. much into big cats at the start and so when i got the chance to go to ladakh one of my key focus was to of course my duty was to find a good spot for the snow leopard and get to know that better but a part of me always wanted to go find the brown bears and that kind of was a draw for me so 3 months into ladakh i decided to take a bus and go towards western ladakh where i've heard there are bears in some area so my initial search was in the suru valley and that's when i kind of had a very interesting encounters with bears and I actually stayed with the buckle walls because they told me that the bears come for their sheep at night and i actually spent some time in the caves along with them and saw my first bears there but of course part of me wanted to make it a experience which others can come and experience along with me and not everyone can come and stay in a cave with buckle walls so that's when we came across dras and a few spots around there and there was a lot to be done again a lot of protected area and the bears were um uh, hibernating through the winter months and in the month of april when they wake up with their young ones usually uh they're extremely hungry and the urge to feed takes them to the closest village so again a huge conflict area a very different set of people most of them are uh, tribal communities who have the sheena origins in dras so it took me a while to understand the people the wildlife and all of that and of course hashim and rahul all of them came in and we tried doing something there but of course it didn't work as smoothly as it did in central ladakh with the snow leopards because of course we had the backing of the snow leopard conservancy there 
but yes it was an interesting experience great and <laughs> Yeah yeah please please go ahead, go so ahead. now what i mean my concern now and i think this is a concern all over the world is what is going to happen with this whole pandemic lockdown um and the embargo on international flights and um people worrying about um you know being in the indoors of course there's been talk of at when it's really cold um you know the the virus actually acts stronger and it's really worrying um so people have been very <laughs> skeptical about travel how is yeah. this going to impact on people like norbu how is it going to impact on the village of ule and and how is it going to change things if tourism doesn't come back in a big way for a year year and a half i mean uh, lataka i mean it is pretty obvious what's going to happen when you when someone's economy and lifestyle has been changed Mm-hmm. by the new influx of a lot of money with snowlopper tourism you have you have to realize that their lives though self sustaining and a very happy life it wasn't financially as comfortable as what it is now because of the benefits of this and not just norbu i'm talking about drivers travel agents in leh hotel owners in leh other people in the village who are employed by the lodge because suddenly they had a 12 month uh, pattern to income you know so before before the winter months were just idle time so of course it's going to affect it and you of course know what happened in 2012 with a whole tourism ban that was being brought in by the supreme court and then it was of course revoked but in that time if you remember latika you know that how the villagers reacted some of them actually said we'll burn down the forest if there's no income for us from increment and in fact it happened in kana and bandavgarh in a few places also so in a situation like that if you can imagine that happening to someone who's employed by the tourism industry imagine the plight of people who are actually running the tourism industry but having said that i believe there is a future i believe 2021 is going to be a good year i believe that people will figure out a way as they've always done the challenges would be flights larger hotels in delhi uh, but wherever we come for wild wildlife experiences so uh, like uh, isolation and social distancing is uh, something which we do normally it is not uh, necessary that it's something we have to enforce separately but the biggest challenge is going to be international flights and larger hotels so that's something people will figure out i feel but right now even all of us are in the dark with regards to what's going to happen yeah it's this is a big 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 issue yeah mm-hmm. okay so there's also um all of this talk about climate change and you know the the patterns of rainfall changing in ladakh Um, and we've seen um, the great flash floods that have happened, and and how uh, greening is not necessarily a good solution for something like Nepal. Uh, um, so can we talk a little bit about that? Because this is not an issue that a lot of people discuss. Of course, of course. Uh, see, uh, Latika, my time in uh, Ladakh has is basically the last four and a half years. but most of what i'm saying is based on what i've heard and whatever i've seen in the four years but what i've seen in the four years may not be a basis because it's a very short period to assess the weather patterns of a region but in general whatever i've spoken ladakh is heavily dependent on the winter snowfall to make sure the water availability is there for the summer in fact mm-hmm. i personally have seen that when the snow snow levels are higher in the winters mm-hmm. the flowering and the grasses and the amount of flora that explodes in the summer months is much higher as compared to a dry winter month mm-hmm. uh, so there is a huge dependency on the winter snow so what climate change da- has been doing in ladakh is kind of breaking this pattern they've been snow late into the month of may and june which is when they farm so you can imagine a, a blanket of snow over their young crop is going to cause a lot of havoc and at the same time if you have a snowless winter though it's not a norm like i said it's a it's a trans himalaya it's a cold desert but it is bound to get some amount of snow but if you have a snowless winter season you're going to have a streams drying up much faster so solutions have been thought about there are generally an intrinsic water conservation thought process in ladakh with the local community in fact even at the lodge we're thinking of going back to dry toilets which the locals have been using and not have uh, wet toilets that which is what the world wants and we are trying to figure out a comfortable way of doing it but having said that we have to study it a lot more to understand whether it is actually a short term thing or something that, where a solution can be worked out like uh, the 
in uh, Ladakh they've started this new ice tupas thing which can mm-hmm. supplement the water solution but all of these are experiments and it is good to do experiments but the final solution is definitely going to be a while before we understand what exactly to do okay and so tell me also about things like uh, waste generation um and and uh, the you know heavier requirement for drinking water bathing water you know when you have huge influxes of tourists does this actually impact on the villages and does it affect uh the surrounding areas because waste decomposition doesn't happen at these higher altitudes yeah yeah so um so, absolutely latika so, so uh, how does this um uh, affect Um, I mean, it is it is probably the biggest problem in Ladakh. Uh, yeah. uh, it is the biggest problem right now in Ladakh because uh, there has been a huge influx of tour- tourists, especially in the four months of summer. Mm. Uh, suddenly, the number of people which can come in a year can go between hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. I'm just talking about four months, and of course. A lot of it is spoken about as a tourist problem, but local lifestyles have also changed. People are progressing there, and they are learning from outside. You can definitely say the outsiders have the blame for it, but their local lifestyles have changed, mm-hmm. and the usage of things and their way of living has also changed. So there is a very dire need for a solution for all this. Right now, everything is being dumped in a particular place outside Leh, and they set fire. and this kind of waste generation both by civilians and the army and the tourists has in my eye the biggest problem that it has caused is the outburst of a huge number of feral dogs in throughout ladakh and you've been seeing that latika you saw it yeah. when you came also yeah and our wolves and the breeding saras cranes and the breeding birds and the uriel which live around the indus valley all of them have been heavily affected by this dogs in fact the wolves have been cross breeding with dogs to such an extent that for two years in between in ule we only saw the crosses and we never saw true wolves and wow. that is extremely worrying yeah so trash can actually complicate things which you don't naturally see with the naked eye like unless you are there in the landscape something like the wolf story mm-hmm. but having said that there is now some effort there is a there is a setup for waste management in choglam sir there is a plastic ban which is slowly being imposed on the hotels in leh there is actually a water consumption uh, like norm or a guideline which is going to be brought in so a lot of it is going to be done uh, but again like i told you it is something which we have to wait and see how it is implemented we can't implement the same solutions which we do in bombay or ahmedabad or gujarat Absolutely. as we do in ladakh like you said the decomposition rates are lot slower and the kind of waste generated and where it can be dumped and the wind of course takes waste through a lot larger, larger area so we'll have to figure out a lot of things but from our end that's no leopard lodge we don't use plastic and we use the kabadi wala extremely uh, on a regular basis so that our waste is taken to the kabadi wala and the lay market who takes it to someone in jammu and everything is recycled and our efforts year after year uh it is definitely focused on reducing the amount we are actually taking back from ule after every group we are trying to quantify it measure it and figure out a solution but if the lay authorities figure out a solution on their part everything complements each other and can go a long way in changing this the way we look at ladakh or tourism in ladakh fantastic um i also wanted to understand have you ever seen examples of snow leopards actually coming and scavenging on um meat waste that has been disposed of in these sites have you had any examples of that no no latika i have not actually seen that though i have seen that when snow leopard come close to villages the dogs do chase them away uh-huh. but again that is something where we can't assume they're coming for the waste they could actually be just passing through or coming right. for a live domestic animal right. so i actually haven't seen a snow leopard going and feeding on waste probably okay. because there is food availability but i've seen brown bears do it heavily yes bear I've do seen it yeah foxes uh-huh. wolves uh, yeah. i've seen uh, stone martens do it weasels mm-hmm. do it Uh, mm-hmm. generally the omnivores and the more adaptable animals do it i personally mm-hmm. haven't heard of or come across a snow leopard doing it so i can't comment on the matter 
on that. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now uh, there's another amazing cat that um, we haven't talked about at all, <laughs> which is the lynx, um, yes. which shares, um, you know, and overlaps with the snow leopard. Um, tell us about the lynx. Have you come across it? What do you know about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, lynx, of course, uh, that is my. In a way, the palace's cat and the lynx were something lynx. I was really after uh, looking for the snow leopard. So, the lynx, as per literature and as per the work that Dr. Raghu has done and a few autofister and a few people have done, the Changkang area, which is the extension of Tibet into Ladakh and the Nubra Valley, seem to be the best parts. But uh, what we saw was that in places where there is a thick scrub, even on the more higher mountain slopes like uh, Gandala in uh, Rumbak, like Yurutse, Warila, Changla, all those places, lynxes were actually distributed in all these spots. So there is no pattern to this in some way. But you can say that when the habitat was rife and there was enough uh, woolly hairs available to prey on or enough pikas available to prey on, the lynxes were there. So in Ule, unfortunately, we don't have any lynx because we don't have as many woolly hair or a thick bush as you've seen. But in a place like Yurutse or in Nubra or Varila, the landscape and the vegetation is different. So lynxes are there. So I've seen lynx in Nubra, of course, and I've seen lynx in Yurutse, in Rubak. I've got a glimpse in the Changtang area, but I won't count it. But I know of uh, a few pockets in Ladakh where you can see them. And if you actually look at the photographs of lynx from different parts, some people say it's a subspecies. The ones in Nubra are more red in color. The ones in Yurit say are gray. I haven't seen enough to comment on that, but definitely not a small cat. <laughs> I can tell you that much. It is a 26 to 25 kilograms. People have seen it bring down a barrel, which is the prey of a snow leopard. People have seen it bring down Markor as the new video was released in Pakistan. So definitely not a small cat, a powerful muscular cat with a short tail, tall ears, very similar to anything uh, we would imagine like a caracal or a, like an Iberian lynx or a, uh, a Canadian lynx. So in a lot of ways, or a bobcat, a lot of ways, very similar in behavior and habitat, but unfortunately very poorly studied in the landscape. So we don't know the numbers, like we don't know with the snow leopards, we don't know the numbers, we don't know the diet, we don't know their patterns. But recently, from whatever I've seen, I can see that they have two to three young ones. People have been seeing them regularly in some parts of Ladakh. So yes, a lot of indirect evidences, but no consistent study. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, this, of course, brings another thought to mind for those of us who are really hardcore, keen cat people. Um, this is actually a good time and a great opportunity um, to practice social distancing and do more immersive longer holidays and Absolutely. get people like yourselves to go off and do a search for the brown bear or the lynx or something like that and just do a little private trip and do mm -hmm. a longer stay um, and that actually might actually help with the tourism problem also because at least there'll be sustained income coming in for uh, villagers you know and um, it's not necessarily about mass tourism but it's about the quality of the Absolutely. experience you know so i think this is a great time to be doing this yeah i think um, that we should always be doing that but uh, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately this is when we realize that we can do it <laughs> yes, yes yes absolutely and the yeah. palaces cat tell us about the palaces cat oh <laughs> the palaces cat uh, it is probably the weirdest animal I've seen, Latika. Okay. Uh, so, the Latin name Ontocolobus manul literally mm -hmm. means ugly ears. A mm -hmm. cat, an animal with ugly ears, and that's uh -huh. what it means. Uh -huh. So, I spent one uh, autumn looking for the palace cat because I'd already gone up before the snow leopard season started. So, I had a little bit of spare time. So, in Ladakh, there are a few places where it's been recorded. But uh, of course, the extreme eastern tip of the Changtang Plateau is where uh, people say the palace's cat can be better seen, though there are reports from other places. So I went to this place, Hanle, as you know it, and uh, I spoke to uh, one of the homestay owners. He directed me to a few spots to look for uh, palace's cats. And one morning, I remember, left early morning, 5.30, of course, freezing cold. And then reached this rocky outcrop that the homestay owner mentioned. 
and right behind it there's this vertical cliff with a lot of holes in it and of course early morning twilight i'm putting my binoculars through these holes and you see this small white thing looking at back at me and i have no idea it's a hole and there's a face you know it's and it's dark so i had a, a decent camera then so i took some shots zoomed in boosted up the iso all the jazz and of course there was this palace cat looking back at me and i was like wow i mean who would have thought and then this thing walks out from the hole to climb further up the rock probably as a reaction to me i don't know what it is uh, but what it has uh, uh, latika was this hairy mass coming out of both its sides so it actually looks like an animal which is just floating because you can't see the legs and it's just a whole lot of hair walking and it just went and sat in its place sat there the whole day swapped at some birds and they actually have middens like rhino so they document they deposit their uh, droppings in a particular place and it comes out regularly for that in the day so i actually spent the whole day with that cat and it was fantastic but definitely one of the most weird animals i have come across i uh, forget about cats any animal yeah amazing so you know i I've, i've had a very uh, close relationship with ladakh mm-hmm. because my grandparents used to be in sirinagar and okay. the first time i went there was in the 70s wow uh, okay. with the wow. army yeah a long long time ago and i wasn't born uh, then <laughs> <laughs> and um, when when um, uh, you know Ashish and Joanna were filming, and then and when Raghu was doing his PhD work, um, they would all come to the farm to my grandparents' place, and so I've known them pretty much Fantastic. for a long, Fantastic. long, long time. So, but I've never seen a palace's cat. I've I've seen lots of pictures and met people who've seen it, but. That's yeah. on my list. I really, really yeah. want we'll, to go. We'll try it. once. Well, I heard Sikkim is also good nowadays, yeah. along with the sand yeah. fox. Uh, there are parts yeah. of Sikkim which is also good for the palace. But of course, Mongolia yeah. is the spot if you really want to get uh, yeah. a sure yeah. shot and yeah. things like that. Well, God willing, we'll all be traveling soon. So. Yeah. Oh, God willing. Yes, yeah. of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Okay so thank you so much that's been really really super interesting and um I think Absolutely. we go back with thoughts on what to do um to help with the conservation tourism situation because that seems to be the key for um lessening um animosity and um decreasing human wildlife conflict especially with the snow leopards today this is a a great beginning because I think when the industry comes together and for the first time you have um, scientists tourism people photographers and naturalists coming together to talk about issues um you know it's a great beginning and a very strong message going out so great talking to you thank you so much thank you ladika um it's been Thanks a pleasure and i um, hope to get you bye 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 bye, bye. documented a pride for the last 18 years so i went back i gathered information like kind of put these pieces together and i had 18 years of a lion pride's life